Welcome to a place we call home. We are a church of grace, truth, and compassion. Worshiping God. Growing families. Reaching communities. Welcome to Hinsdale Seventh day Adventist Church. Happy Sabbath, church family. I think that's the way sometimes the week goes, right? You think something's going to work and it just falls apart. But then Sabbath comes along, right? And it gives us an opportunity to be able to recharge. An opportunity to reset. An opportunity to reconnect with our Lord and our Savior. By the way, I'm so happy you guys are here. It wouldn't be the same without you. So welcome to our church. Welcome to your church. If you're seeing us from home, we're glad that you're visiting with us. We're glad you are here with us because together... We are going to experience worship this morning. So we want to invite you to be with us as we begin our worship service with our scripture reading. Today's scripture is from the book of Psalm, chapter 34, verses 1 through 5. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell all the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt in his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Father God, we come before you recognizing that you are our God, recognizing that you are the Lord of all, recognizing that you are our shepherd, recognizing that you are our friend. And Father, meet us in this place, we ask. We ask that you would be glorified by the worship we bring. We ask that you would transform our hearts and our minds. We ask that you would transform our relationships. We ask that you would transform our year and our day. We simply ask that you would meet us in this place. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. I will ask you to stand one more time so we can sing hymn number 503, A Quiet Place.
may be seated. Father, we come before you today very grateful that you gave us this day. In your wisdom, you uh, set aside a day that we can reflect on everything you do for us. We thank you for who you are, for your majesty, for your power. And we ask that you would be with us today and help each one of us to know you better. Some of us, Father, um, our gratitude meter is a little bit low. We've been through um, a tough week. Maybe we've been uh, financial situations, marriage situations, family situations, work situations. But you know, Father, we can give it all to you. We don't have to carry that one more minute. You will take that burden off of us, and we can have faith that you will deliver us. We also know, Father, that many times that we feel like uh, we are in really good position with you. We're very, very happy with what you've done. And other times, we feel like we're in the darkest valley. But we know, Lord, that you can make a way and that you can, you're the same God on the mountaintop who's also with us in the valley. Strengthen us, Father. Help us to learn to spend time in your word and learn to talk to you every day. We want to increase our friendship with you, Father. We want to be able to call you a kind, compassionate friend. I ask this morning that you would uh, bless Jason, Pastor Jason. Make the words that he speaks to us, the words that, that have come from you. And I just ask that each one of us would lift our eyes to you and know that you love us, want what's best for us, and will never forsake us. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you, Chloe and Ellie, as well, for playing this morning. I so appreciate it. We are in our sermon series for the month of January called Rooted, and this is talking about the spiritual disciplines. If you missed last week, uh, you can also you can watch, certainly online, but you can also go to the brief little study guide and follow along there. In fact, this week, I don't know if you noticed, but there's also a study guide when you came in and picked up your bulletin. Uh, you might have seen a little sign there for your study guide. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I would encourage you to pull out your smartphones right now. You can scan that if your phone will reach it, and you can grab today's study guide, and then you can fill it out and email it to yourself or download it or whatever you'd like to do. <clears throat> On this note, talking about the study guide and the changes, I just want to, I want to draw your attention to something. By now you've probably noticed it, by now you might be aware, but just in case you aren't, we uh, have moved to a sleeker, slimmer, more environmentally friendly bulletin, which is mostly just one side. And then also, if you need the, the weekly announcements from the church, we're actually printing them every other week, and those are available when you pick up your bulletin. Those are available generally at the resource desk. But we also have those available online as well as on our app. But uh, by now, yeah, go ahead and, and scan that if you can. Um, I don't know in the back if you can, I, I hope you should be able to get that. And for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, like scan, how do, what, what is this word scan? What do you, if you have a smartphone, which actually, if you have a smartphone, all you have to do is open up the camera and hold it up to that. You don't even have to take a picture. It should just automatically grab that and take you to a, uh, a place where you can fill that in. Um, if that doesn't work, then ask someone that's younger than me, because I... I can't help you with that. It's, it's really interesting. This past week, the pastors and I were gone for a, a good portion of the week, 
at required meetings in um, at Camp Akita, and one of the things they talked about is that 95, I can, I'm gonna get my, my numbers a little bit wrong here, but basically 95% of people under the age of, I think, 35, they have smartphones. I think it's something like 92% of people 35 to 55 have smartphones, and the number dips a little bit from 55 to 65, I think it drops down to like 89% or something like that. Um, and then it actually goes back up, you get over 65 and the number goes back up again to I think it's like 91 or 92. Um, interesting though. So basically what I'm saying is generally you should be able to access this, uh, this study guide here we have. But like I said, last week we kicked off our sermon series on the spiritual disciplines. And this comes from the, the term rooted. It comes from the Bible. It comes from Ephesians 3 where it talks about Paul saying, I pray that you would be deeply rooted and established in love. And last week we also introduced a new song. I hope that you were able to hear it. I know you would be blessed by it and enjoy it if you did hear it. We're going to be singing that again at the close today at the close of the sermon. If you missed it, it's a beautiful song. I, I know you will enjoy it. But we did. Last week we talked, we kicked off by talking about scripture, and today we're going to be talking about prayer. For those of you that might want to catch up, or maybe it's a good refresher for us, I do want to share, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page with the definitions here. It, what is a spiritual discipline? A spiritual discipline is any activity that can help me gain power to live life as Jesus taught and modeled it. A spiritual discipline is any activity that can help me gain power to live life as Jesus taught and modeled it. Now, I could spend probably half a year talking about the spiritual disciplines. There are that many, and they are that important. Um, but why are we bar embarking on this series uh, on spiritual disciplines? Why are we kicking off 2020? with a series on spiritual disciplines, it's because I believe that as Christians, when we operate in the center of the world, because that, the reality is we all operate in, in the center of the world, right? Uh, unless you live in some sort of convent way up on top of a mountain where all you do is meditate and pray and study the scriptures, we all operate in the center of the world. And when we do, when we operate in the center of the world, it requires a deep anchoring in Christ. And so here again, this is why we're exploring this, is because it requires a deep anchoring in Christ. And this is something that I want to be talking about as we kick off this year. So uh, we might be saying, well, hey, spiritual disciplines, I, I don't know, you know, I've heard those are a bad thing. And I want to tell you this. No, no, no. Everything we're going to be talking about comes straight from Scripture. Last week, we talked about Scripture. Today, we're talking about prayer. We don't engage in the spiritual disciplines to please God. This isn't something that we do in order to gain his favor. We don't do this to get him to pay attention to us. We don't do this so that he will say, hey, you know what, I think maybe this person is serious about me. Maybe I will grant their wish. We don't do spiritual disciplines in order to please God. Instead, we do spiritual disciplines to help us create a better connection with God so that we understand his heart better, so that we know how to pray better, so we know how to interpret the scriptures better, so we know how to engage with our fellow humans better. Last week, again, we talked about scripture. That's the primary way. It's not the only way. It's the primary way God speaks to us. Today, we're talking about prayer, which is the primary way, not the only way, but the primary way we speak to God. And it is the habit of our church um, now to stand out of reverence for the reading of the word. So I am going to ask you to stand very briefly for our scripture and then for, uh, again, another opening prayer. But if you would, stand with me. This is the word of the Lord from the writing of Paul. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul's words. Be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray, giving thanks to God. If you would, remain standing with me. Father God, Lord, as we pray to you, before we talk about prayer, I ask that you would open our ears, open our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have us receive today so we can learn how to go deeper with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not, please do not sit down because while you are still standing, this is an excellent opportunity for you to find a neighbor or two 
and answer this question. Have you ever had an instant answer to prayer? Have you ever had a, an instant answer to prayer? Or if you have not had an instant answer to prayer, how would it feel, what would it be like if you were to have an to pray something and have it instantly answered. So find a neighbor or two around you. You can sit back down, but find a neighbor or two around you. Maybe you need to move around. Find a neighbor or two around you and answer this, one of these two questions. How would it feel? What, what would it be like to have an instant answer to prayer? Maybe some of you have experienced this. Maybe some of you have, have prayed a prayer and had an instant response, an instant answer. Um, I'll tell you one time that happened to me. Um, of course, we know the scripture that says, before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear. Um, God already knows. He's already aware. Oftentimes, he's already working on it. But there are times where we do receive an instant answer to prayer. And I remember I was in Papua New Guinea uh, several years ago doing uh, evangelism with a very famous Seventh-day Adventist evangelist over there. And my job as a student under this evangelist was to work, to, was to go out into the crowd and before, the, before every meeting every night was to engage with the, with the people that were arriving, pray with them, talk with them, do Bible studies. And uh, at this particular gathering in Papua New Guinea, there were about 100,000 people that would gather every night. So large, large, large crowd. And uh, we were in, in this stadium that was just massive and people were coming from all over the country. Um, and I remember uh, two women came to me, a mother and daughter, and in, with tears in their eyes, they asked me to pray for the daughter's husband. Now, there is a long, long story to this, um, but basically the prayer was that her husband would find it in his heart to come to the meetings. This had been a long discussion in their home. This had been uh, many, many years of financial, uh, of, I'm sorry, of spiritual trials in their lives. He didn't really want to have anything to do with God, and she kept on insisting, if you would just come and hear these messages. Well, she was sharing this with me, and, and I said, well, let's pray about this. And if I can be very, very honest, how do you pray for a situation like that? You can pray knowing that God wants this husband of hers to, to come into a relationship with him. You can pray knowing that God desires good things for these people, but can you pray truly believing that God is going to answer your prayer in that exact moment? Maybe you have more faith than I did. But I bowed my head with this mother and daughter, and we poured out our hearts before God. And I remember praying words, something like, and God, if you see it within your divine providence, you know, I padded the prayer so that I could, you know, have an escape route, right? God, if, if you can find it within your divine wisdom and providence to bring her husband here to these meetings of 100,000 people in the stadium that where the whole entire country had come together, I mean, the, 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 first of all, the odds that he would come, second of all, anyway... We pray this prayer, we open our eyes, 
And instead of three of us being there, there were four of us in the circle. And with surprise, I looked at this man, who I didn't know who he was, but they did. It was the daughter's husband. In that moment, wow. I learned a lesson in prayer that day. And I'd like to be honest with you that I, I, not all of my prayers are like that. In fact, rarely. The, I, the, I, I'm recounting a story to you from many years ago because this is not commonplace in my life. I don't know about you. I, I think uh, when we grow up, um, perhaps within the Christian denomination, within the Christian church, or, or maybe even within our own Seventh-day Adventist denomination, uh, I think we're taught how to pray. We're, we're given words to speak, but are we ever really taught how to pray? You know, I, I knew that I could, I could pray and I could tell God about my day. I could tell him about the things that made me happy. I could tell God about the things that made me sad. I could tell God about the things that were on my heart. I, I could ask the Holy Spirit to guide me as I opened up the scriptures and dove into Bible study. I could ask for protection for myself and for others. But to be very honest, all of that is a little vanilla. See, my whole life I thought I knew how to pray, but even with all of that, I had this sickening feeling that I didn't really know how to pray. I didn't, I didn't really know. And, you know, I would pour over uh, the scriptures. I would pour over some of the writings of my favorite Christian author who, who makes comments like, prayer is the opening of the heart to God's to a friend. Uh, my favorite Christian author also says things like, prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse. And so I would try to adjust the way that I would pray in order to engage that, to talk to God like a friend. But even then, it still didn't really seem to fit for me. And I think that's because I was approaching this as a to-do. Okay, I'm going to spend time with God, and now, okay, talk to him like a friend. Okay, hi, friend, good to see you. No, I'm not seeing, okay, how does, you know, and so there's this constant battle within our minds. How do we really do this? And I think if we were to be honest, prayer is probably the spiritual discipline that most of us feel guilty about because we think that if we really loved God, we think that if we really had a good relationship with him, we think that if we were a really good Christian, that prayer would flow out of us without effort. And I want to tell you, that's just generally not the case. Not even for Jesus' first followers. The, the reality is, even the disciples who were spending day after day after day after day with Jesus in his very physical presence came to him and said, we don't really understand how to pray. Can you teach us? Can you teach us how to pray? See, prayer doesn't come naturally. Prayer doesn't happen automatically. I want to suggest to you that prayer is actually a learned behavior. Because nobody is born being an expert in prayer. In fact, nobody ever even masters being a prayer. And so today I want to share with you three insights from Colossians 4, three insights about prayer. Three insights uh, about how to pray. The first thing that we saw there in that scripture from Colossians 4 is that we should pray continually, or we should pray with perseverance. We should pray with persistence. So pray with... <laughs> Thank you. Pray with perseverance. Pray with perseverance. Now, this is something that I've been guilty of, and, and, and many, if not Christ, many, many, if not most Christians do this too. We go to God, and we ask once, and then we don't get the answer that we're expecting or that we want, and so we give up. You know, there's this, there's this kind of sovereign silence. And God's on mute. He obviously doesn't care, so I'm out of here, and so we quit. We, we walk away. Now, now, here's the question I want to ask us from for, for first thing on this. But first of all, I, I want to ask this. Don't we admire perseverance when it comes to the world? I mean, we love the story of how Winston Churchill got up and gave that commencement speech where he got up and went to the podium and he said, never 
give up. Never, never, never give up. We, we love stories like that, right? We love the story about how Thomas Edison, who, who failed a thousand times at trying to invent the light bulb, said, I didn't fail a thousand times, I just found a thousand ways that didn't work, or I invented it with a thousand steps. We, we love stories like that, right? We love the stories of Rudy, the football player, right, who played for Notre Dame, he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried, and finally he was allowed to play in one game. So if we love those stories as they happen in, in, in the rest of the world, or, or in the secular world, if we will. Why do we hate it when it comes to prayer? Why, why are those things so difficult? Why is persistence so difficult when it comes to prayer? We love the stories of perseverance in the real world. Why, why, why not when it comes to prayer? Why do we get excited when we hear or see stories about people who just absolutely won't give up, but we only pray one time, and then we throw up our hands and say, well, you know, it seems that God is silent because he, he's not answering, so he must want me to give up. But see, the truth is, the truth is there are not many greater teachings in the New Testament than this teaching about not giving up in prayer. I'm going to say that again. There are not many greater teachings in, in all of the New Testament than this teaching of not giving up in prayer. Because, you see, I believe there's something about persevering in prayer that molds godly Christian character. There's something about persevering in prayer that molds godly Christian character. There's something about persevering in prayer that conforms us to the image of Christ that we're supposed to have. And when you study the teachings of Jesus... You see that he taught this over and over and over again. I mean, I think about Luke 11, the story of the friend knocking at the neighbor's door late at night. He was hungry. Maybe his flight got delayed coming into O'Hare. I don't know. But he keeps banging on the door, and finally his friend opens up and, and says, well, okay, come on in, come on in. And Jesus says, pray like that. Luke 18 there's a bag lady who's been treated unfairly, and she goes to the unjust judge's door, and she keeps banging and banging and banging, and finally he just he opens the door and gives her what she wants. This is Jesus teaching this, and Jesus says in verse 1 of that story, he, it, the Bible says that he told this story in order to teach us, to show us, that we should pray always and never give up. See, persistence in prayer is largely about developing our faith because God somehow moves when faith comes into play. Persistence in prayer is largely about developing us. It's not about changing God as much as it is about changing me. And so many of Jesus' miracles, do you, do you realize this? So many of Jesus' miracles were actually tied to faith. I mean, think about that. They were tied to the faith of the, of the person that needed the miracle. The, the woman with the flow of blood who dove at Jesus' garment like a football player. And when he turns to her, what does he say to her? He says, your faith has made you well. Blind Bartimaeus, he used his cloak to cover himself because people would walk by and they'd toss coins on him. And he finds out that Jesus is coming his way and, and, and he starts walking towards Jesus. He, he casts off his cloak, which, is, which was his form of, of job, if you will, by the way, because people identified him as a beggar by that. He tossed off his cloak and started pursuing Jesus. He starts walking towards Jesus and Jesus says, what is it you want from me? And he says, I want to see and Jesus said to him, your faith has made you well. I think about when Jesus was in Nazareth, Mark chapter 6. It says that Jesus had to leave there. And he couldn't perform very many miracles. Because of their unbelief. Because of their lack of faith. See, I believe that persisting in prayer is about developing our faith. 
Think of it this way. When God places us in the weight room, that's where we develop our faith muscles. We develop our faith muscles in the weight room. Hebrews 11 says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so if we pray once or we pray twice and then we move away, we give up, that's not diligently seeking him. See, he wants to reward. He wants to answer. But we need to diligently seek him. Matthew 7. You, you, you know this story, right? Matthew 7, Jesus says, look, you, you earthly fathers. Let me put it to you this way. You earthly fathers. You have kids. If your kid comes to you and, and asks for food, are you going to say, hey, I'm going to give you a stone instead? How much more will your heavenly father give to those who ask? So therefore, ask, seek, knock. And by the way, if you study this in, in the original language, you come to this, this, this phrase here, and you recognize that the, that the words Jesus is using here, this Greek, the Greek tense of these words means you do it over and over and over and over and over again. The, the language that this was written in is not just, hey, hey, would you mind doing this? I'm looking for it. Okay, thanks. No, the, the language of this suggests coming to God saying, God, this is what I need. God, don't you see the situation I'm in? God, can't you answer this prayer? God, are you, are you hearing me? God, do not turn a blind eye. God, do you see how desperately we need this? God, will you hear my prayer? God, I'm coming to you. We don't just do it once or twice. We keep asking. We keep praying. We keep petitioning. We keep requesting. And look, if our world thinks that perseverance is such a good thing, how much more is perseverance a good thing in the spiritual realm? That's the first thing from Colossians 4. It says persistence or perseverance in prayer. The second thing is have an alert mind. Now, what's interesting about this is a lot of people in a lot of places uh, attribute this to the second coming which I don't really have a problem with that, and I think it's, it's largely true. But I think that here, in this verse, when it says keep alert or have an alert mind, I actually think what this is talking about is, is the way that we pray. Not so much that we're paying attention to like, hey, you know, I think Jesus is coming back again, so we're going to continue to pray. I have no issue with that. But I think what this is really saying is pay attention to the way that you pray because there are things that can come along in life that hinder our prayers. There are things that come along in life that keep our prayers from reaching God the way that they should. And you might be thinking, okay, what, whoa, whoa, what are those things? I have a list here. Um, so you can fill these out in your study guide. I think one of them is pride. Pride is what caused Lucifer to become Satan. God can't work at a life that's full of pride. Pride is the opposite of humility. Pride can keep the power of God from working in our lives. Uh, another thing is unconfessed sin. Psalm 66 verse 16 says, If I had not confessed the sin of my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So if we have sin in our lives that we are not giving up to God, that is a hindrance to our prayers. Now, all of us have unconfessed sin, and so we need to spend time alone with God and do what it says in Psalm 139, where, it's, where it says, God, search my heart, right? So search my heart and let me know those areas of sin that I need to give up to you. So pride, unconfessed sin, I think idols in our hearts. Ezekiel 4, uh, 14, 3 says, the leaders have set up idols in their hearts. They have embraced things that will make them fall into sin. Why should I listen to their requests? So God is saying, look, the leaders have these things that are more important to them than truly seeking me. Why, why would I listen to them? Of course, an idol, it doesn't have to be a thing made of stone or something made of wood. It can be something made out of electronics. An idol is anything that we spend more time with than God. And I'll have to be honest. I think in my day, I'm just going to be honest with you, I spend more time looking down than I do looking up. That's a struggle for me. 
Maybe it is for you too. Is there anything that you love more than God? You, see, you might say, well, I don't love you know, my electronics more than God. But I would ask you, that might be true. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, can you take an inventory of your life? Can you take a look at your checkbook? Can you take a look at your calendar and recognize where your priorities are? Can you, can you maybe put a little tracking app on your phone to figure out how much time you're actually spending touching your phone every day? Pride in the heart, unconfessed sin, idols uh, in the heart. How about this? Lack of generosity. This is a crazy one, but think about this. Proverbs 21, 13 says, those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. Man, that's one of the reasons I am so thrilled that when I showed up at this church, this church said, no, no, no. We're engaging in our local community. We're engaging with the, with the mobile food pantry. We are actively doing something, and we want to continue to grow in that direction of reaching our community and doing something tangible for their needs. So I, I love that. Uh, another one. So pride, unconfessed sin, idol in the heart, lack of generosity, unforgiveness. Whoa. Unforgiveness. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Bitterness is a killer of prayer. And I have to be honest, this is one of the things that I am constantly learning to do because this is something that I wrestle with. Anybody here wrestle with bitterness? Don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. We all have bitterness. We all have unforgiveness. We all have things in our lives that we just have a hard time letting go of. And one of the ways that I deal with this personally, and I'm just going to share with you, is by going back to that Luke 18 story of the, of the widow, right, and the unjust judge. She had been treated unfairly. She had been treated unjustly. And, and my goodness, I struggle with this. And, and, and because I, I personally struggle with this, I don't, I don't want to just blow by this and go on to the next point. Because maybe I need to preach to me for a minute and you can listen in. How is it that we know when we've actually forgiven someone? Because I'll be honest, I, I, you know, I can, I can delay it all before God. I can have a tender moment with God where I say, oh, God, I, I really, I just want to live in your presence, and I don't want anything to distract me from you. And I, I really, I just want to let go of that hurt. I want to let go of that pain. I want to let go of that wrong. I want to let go of that unjust thing that happened to me. And I just want to be able to focus on you, not because I'm, I'm trying to live a holy life, but because I want to live a life in you. And, and I want to forget about that. And I can have those tender moments. I can have those amazing moments where I just fully and completely just lay it all at God's feet and I truly forgive and I truly walk away. And then I go to bed and I wake up next morning. And I'm like, you know what? You know, and I climb into that hypothetical argument simulator, also known as the shower. You know, I'm like, <laughs> Or so it's the next day, or maybe it's a week, a week later, or maybe it's even a month later, that all those feelings come roaring back into my life, and the pain is real, and the pain is fresh, and the pain is painful. And then I question myself, well, oh, did I really forgive? I mean, well, I don't know if I really forgave that person, because obviously I'm still wrestling with this. So how do we know that we've forgiven someone? <laughs> I, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you the elusive thing of, well, you'll know because the pain isn't there anymore. Uh, <laughs> look, that's true. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to downplay that. But I just want to say that sometimes we haven't arrived there yet because we have to be honest, we have to be sincere, we have to, to, to lay it before God over and over and over again. Just like the, the, the widow who had been unjustly wronged, she had to keep going back to God. God, I'm giving this to you. I'm giving this to you. I'm placing this in the rightful place. I recognize that I can't handle this. You're the only one that can handle this. You're the only one that can deal with this. I'm going to keep placing it on, at you. So God, I'm giving this to you again. God, I'm giving this to you again. God, I know I was here last week, but I'm giving this to you again. God, I know I was here yesterday, but I'm giving this to you again. God, I know I was here five minutes ago, but I'm giving this to you again for the hundredth time, for the thousandth time, for the whatever. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that the hundredth time is going to be vastly easier than the 99th time or the 98th time. It's probably going to be a little bit easier than the 25th time. But every time, it gets a little bit easier. 
And do you know how we go to God? Do you know how we give it to God? Like Luke 18 says, we pound on the door of heaven. We say, God, I'm giving this to you. I'm giving this to you because you can be more just than I ever can. Anyway, let's move on. Pride, unconfessed sin, uh, unforgiveness, idol in the heart, idols in the heart, lack of generosity. Not honoring your spouse. 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands must honor your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Now, I want to ask all of you, but I especially want to address the men. This applies to the women, too, so listen up, but especially the men. Are you honoring your wives? Are you honoring your wives with your words, with what you're watching? Are you honoring them? Anyway, let's move on to the three points that we pull from Paul in Colossians 4. We pray with perseverance, we pray with an alert mind, and we pray with a thankful heart. I think that the reason Paul wants us to pray this way is to help us continue to fight against pride because one of the ways that we fight pride in our lives is by continually being thankful. See, when, we, when we're thankful, we recognize that everything we have just comes from God. When we're thankful, we recognize that nothing that we have done is what has brought us the things that we have. On one occasion, Dwight Moody, you know, this, this very famed evangelist, Dwight Moody was being poured out on, with blessing upon blessing upon blessing, and, and he was realizing, one day he just was, he was seized with this realization that, that God was pouring out more than he could even take, and, and he was so encouraged and he was so overwhelmed that he just paused to pray and he said, stop, God. Now his prayer wasn't eloquent, his prayer wasn't beautiful, but his prayer was one of gratitude. And if Moody, who was this great evangelist and was eloquent in speech and could stand before thousands of people and proclaim the gospel in, in, in ways that would, would make people want to lean in closer, if he could pray a prayer that was just kind of bumbling and not eloquent, then maybe there's hope for us too. See, as I said earlier, no one is born an expert in prayer. Uh, no one ever masters it. Uh, even this man named Thomas Merton, who if you've read any of his things, it's very, very quality stuff. He, he says that we do not want to be beginners. Let us be convinced of the fact that we will never be anything but beginners all of our lives. In other words, and he's talking about prayer. In other words, we don't want to be beginners, but we have to recognize that's all we're ever going to be because we can never master prayer. So what is it that beginners like you and me and Thomas Merton, what do we pray for? Well, how do we pray? We pray simple prayers. Most people experience this gap between what they think they're supposed to pray and what they're really thinking about. I don't know if you can identify with that. You know, we think, okay, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray all these righteous and godly things, and then we kneel down and we're like, did I feed the dog? Oh, man, I forgot to tell my kids about the appointment next week. And simple prayer is about removing that gap between what we think we're supposed to be praying about and what's running through our minds. Richard Foster says, we bring ourselves before God just as we are, warts and all. We don't try to sort out the good from the bad. We tell God, for example, how frustrated we are with the coworker at the office or the neighbor down the street. We ask for food. We ask for favorable weather. We ask for good health. Dallas Willard, another spiritual giant, uh, added, the way to get to the meaningful prayer for those good things is to start by praying for what we're truly interested in. In other words, the things that are running through your mind it's perfectly fine to pray about those things. That's one of the ways that we learn to grow, and it's one of the things that God is allowing to be running through our minds because those are the things that are occupying our daily life. So when those things, when you're in the middle of a heartfelt prayer and you think, did I feed the dog? 
God, help me to be more mindful. God, thank you for your creation. God, thank you for the joy that this animal brings into our lives. God, thank you for the patience it's teaching me because it keeps chewing on the legs of our brand new furniture. True story last night, okay. We need to be fully present. John Ortberg says, if my mind keeps returning to a particular topic during prayer, it's probably an indication that this is the topic that is of most concern to me and I need to talk about with God. It might be that when our mind wanders, it's that wandering that that God is saying, hey, talk to me about that. Talk to me about the real things in your life. So instead of of us thinking about those silly things like, well, did I do this? Or I need to make sure that I do that? or, Or... Take advantage of the fact that our mind is whirling and use those things as stepping stones. Don't view them as barriers. Think of them as stepping stones into the heart of God. So uh, simple prayers. Be fully present. Pray for others. While simple prayer may be the type most commonly practiced in Scripture, intercessory prayer is the kind of prayer that's most commonly commanded in Scripture. I'm going to say that again. Simple prayer is probably the one that's talked about most in Scripture. But intercessory prayer, praying for someone else, is the kind that's commanded most in Scripture. So when we, when we intercede for others, we expand the circle of our concern beyond ourselves to other people. Last one. Prayer as a relationship. I love this quote by John Overberg. I don't think it made it into your study guide, so maybe you can... Take a picture of it or something. Of all the work that gets done through prayer, of all the work, there's a lot of work that gets done through prayer. Prayer is power. Prayer changes things. But of all the work that gets done through prayer, perhaps the greatest work of all is the knitting of the human heart together with the heart of God. Of all the work that gets done in prayer, the greatest work is that my heart can be knit together with God. Of course, during prayer, we shouldn't be doing all the talking. Remember I said the scripture is the primary way, not the only way, but the primary way God speaks to us. Prayer is the primary way, not the only way, but the primary way that we speak to God. But we shouldn't do all the talking during prayer. We should allow God to speak to us. We should allow God to speak to our, our inner thoughts and to our, and to our hearts. We, we do that by being silent before him, like the scripture says. We do that by opening the scriptures. We do that by, by taking a walk through nature and letting him speak to us through the second book. Maybe it even requires placing an empty chair beside us so that can help remind us that God is with us and listening to us. Maybe it means taking that empty chair and having a conversation with that empty chair, both speaking and listening. I won't get into this this too much. But one of the most impactful ways I ever experienced listening during prayer was when I was in seminary. It's not the only time. I've had many of others where I listen during prayer. But here I was in seminary, and, and uh, our professor was talking about prayer that day, and he said, I, I'm, I'm convinced that we don't listen enough in prayer. And so I want to ask you to, to partner up with someone and pray with and for that person, but I want you to ask God to give you a message for that person. Whoa. (laughs) That's intense. You want me to ask God to give me a message for this person next to me. I'm not a prophet. (laughs) I'm not the son of a prophet. You know, like, do do you seriously expect me, God, to hear what you have to say and, and, and deliver that correctly? This was our assignment. And I think we spent most of the class period doing this. And, and there I was sitting next to a very, very good friend of mine who had recently experienced some major pain in his home. Um, they were expecting their second child, and they had miscarried. 
And I knew that. But as I was praying for my friend, God told me to tell him that the pain in his home, the pain in his life, was not yet gone, but that joy was coming in the morning. Now I th thought I knew what that meant, but I'm not gonna say that. I mean, think, I mean, no, don't raise your hand, but would you say that? And when we prayed, my friend shared with me what it was he felt God had laid on his heart to share with me. And they said, God gave you a message for me. And I said, I'm not sure about that. And he said, no, I, I trust that God gave you a message for me. What is it? And I said, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't even, I'm not sure. I don't know. I think I misheard God. He said, no, tell me. I said, okay. This is what I think I heard. If I'm wrong, it's all me. <laughs> don't go blaming God. Um, basically, uh, I think he told me that the pain in your home from this past summer has not yet been fully removed from your home. And he thought about it and said, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's true. But I think, I think what you're telling me is that I need to go home and I need to check with my wife and just touch base with her on a spiritual level about this. I said, okay. And I was ready to let that go. And he said, but there's more. And I said, no, no. He said, no, there's something more. And I got real squirmish. I said, okay, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what this means, but I think God told me to tell you that there's joy coming in the future? He said, okay. I said, I don't, don't hold me accountable to that. I don't know if God said that or not. That could have been my own head. I don't know. Maybe I had pizza last night. I don't just... What he didn't know when I had that conversation with him, but he found out within a week was that his wife was indeed pregnant. I'm not standing here telling you that I'm so holy. I'm not standing here and telling you that I have a special connection with God. I'm standing here telling you that if me in my own doubt and vulnerability can pray to God and say, God, can you give me a message? I think there's so many times where God is anxious to do that in each and every one of our lives. I think he's anxious. I think he's desperate. I think he's pleading for us to open up our hearts to him and not just share with him what's on our heart, but to also say, God, I'm going to be silent for a few minutes and I'm going to let you talk to me. Maybe you have something to tell me. Maybe you have something to tell me for my next door neighbor. Maybe you have something to tell me for my father. Maybe you have something to tell me for my coworker. But God, I am opening myself up to you and the possibility that you might want to speak through me. And when you do that, there's probably nothing more scary and nothing more amazing than to see God work. Prayer. Prayer. Can we connect with God? Can we connect with God this week? Go in the grace of God and share the grace of God.